Hello and welcome back to the video series about the Fourier transform. And in today's part 6, we will finally define the so-called Fourier series. And after all our work from before, it's really easy to do that in an L2 setting. And there please recall, L2 means the space of the square integrable functions. However, as always, before we start with the definition, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via Patreon. And please don't forget, as a supporter, you can download additional material with the link in the description. And with that, let's immediately start by stating the vector spaces from the last video. First of all, we always consider two pi periodic functions and they are defined on the real number line. And then we defined the integrable functions and went to equivalence classes. And what we got is this L1 space. And in a similar way, we defined the square integrable functions and they form a subset in L1. The reason for that is simply that we calculate the integral from minus pi to pi. This means if the integral exists where the absolute value is squared inside the integral, then it also exists if the absolute value is just to the power 1. So that's something to remember. It's not a general effect, but for the 2 pi periodic functions, we have this inclusion here. And moreover, we also know that the trigonometric polynomials given by cosine and sine functions form a subset in both spaces here. And now what we will do in this video is to consider only these two spaces here. Because there we can use everything we know about orthogonal projections. The only thing we need for that is an inner product and we have that for L2. Namely, if you take two functions f and g, and there you already know, it does not matter, you can see them as functions or as equivalence classes of functions. In the end, it's the same because we put both of them into an integral anyway. Moreover, we also already know it's helpful to have the scaling factor 1 over pi here. However, the scaling factor is not important here. The essential part is that we have the product of both functions inside the integral. And since we already deal with the general complex valued functions here, we will take the complex conjugate in the first component. This is needed to satisfy all properties of an inner product in a complex vector space. And in fact, soon we will see that it is easier to work in the complex vector space than in the real vector space. But first, let's recall that we already know a lot about orthogonality in this space here. For example, we already know that the ordinary cosine function and the ordinary sine function are orthogonal with respect to this inner product. And moreover, they are even normalized because we chose the correct scaling factor here. So let's formulate this with the fact that we have an orthonormal system. And let's call it B with an index n. And inside this family, I want to have the constant function, which we choose as x is sent to the constant 1 over the square root of 2 and the cosine and sine functions which means we have cosine of x, cosine of 2x, and so on. However, let's stop these functions at the natural number n. And then, naturally, we do the same with the sine functions. So if you want to count, we have 2n plus 1 functions inside this family. And please recall from the last videos that this is an orthonormal system in L2 for every n. So in short, we would say it's an O and S in L2 with respect to this inner product. And now you might already see that in the end we want to make n bigger and bigger. But at the moment we don't consider any limits, we just consider a fixed n here. Because then we just have a finite dimensional space spanned by this family Bn. And maybe let's simply call this finite dimensional space in L2 Un. And as I already said it before, the dimension of this space is 2n plus 1. And in order to keep it simple, we could give the function some short names and maybe let's call them h1, h2 and so on. And moreover, this capital N here is then 2n plus 1. And you might already know, 
we do that to simply apply our linear algebra knowledge. In particular, if we take any function f from L2, we want to talk about the orthogonal projection. Namely, the orthogonal projection onto this finite dimensional subspace Un. Which means, by definition, it's a trigonometric polynomial. And in fact, from linear algebra, we know all the nice properties from the orthogonal projection. For example, we have a nice formula to calculate it and we know it minimizes the distance. And this fact is exactly known as the approximation formula for the orthogonal projection. Therefore, it's the perfect candidate for our approximation with trigonometric polynomials. And the name for the orthogonal projection here will be curved fn of lowercase f. And by linear algebra, we already know it's given by this linear combination of the basis vectors in un. Hence, the inner product we have here are the Fourier coefficients we have to calculate. So I would say, let's do that in the next step. But here, please don't forget that this minimizing thing from the orthogonal projection holds in L2. Which means we measure this distance with the L2 norm given by the inner product. So it's always important to remember what is the actual function we measure the distance with. But before we talk about more details there, let's first write down the definition of the Fourier series. It should be given by this curved fn of f, but we already know it's a function as well. Which means we can also evaluate that at a point x. And indeed, the formula above already tells us what we have to write down here. The first h in the sum is the constant function, which means we have 1 divided by the square root of 2. And the corresponding Fourier coefficient we can just call a0 tilde. We use the tilde to avoid confusion with some other common notations. However, then for the cosine functions, we just put in the function and the Fourier coefficient we just call a k. And the ones for the sine functions are called b k. So there we have our trigonometric polynomial and the formula above tells us how to calculate these Fourier coefficients. Hence, the first one here is just given by the inner product constant function with f. Which is, by definition, 1 divided by pi times the integral. And inside we have the constant function times f of x. So not so complicated and in the end you should see that the two square roots here multiply to one half. And now we can quickly do the other coefficients. Let's start with the cosine functions. There we also have 1 over pi times the integral of the cosine function times f of x. So all these integrals you have to solve to get all the coefficients a k. And now very easily we can do the same thing with the sine function. So we have this integral for the bk coefficients. And that's it. This is what you should remember because with these formulas you can calculate such a Fourier expansion. And now this map or the sequence we get out if we go through all natural numbers n is called the Fourier series. So you could say the Fourier series of f is just a sequence of trigonometric polynomials. And please note, everything we have written here makes sense if f comes from L2 because then we have the orthogonal projection. However, the thing is now that one can just extend this result to a function in L1 as well. Simply by ignoring the inner product and by just using the formulas here on the right hand side. Simply because cosine and sine are bounded functions we don't have any problem with the existence of these integrals. However, the question then would be what is the interpretation in the L1 case if we don't have the orthogonal projection? Since this is not so easy to answer, this is definitely something for another video. In this video we stay in L2 and now we look at an example. And I would say let's keep it simple, let's take a piecewise constant function. And since we want to have a 2 pi periodic function, it's enough to explain f on a bounded interval. More precisely, we just say what happens between minus pi and pi. First, I want to have 1 if x comes from minus pi to 0. And 0 if x lies in the interval from 0 to pi. 
So this is a very nice function and we can extend it to a 2 pi periodic function. Indeed, the graph of the function does not look complicated at all. We just have a lot of jumps, but otherwise we just repeat the same constants again and again. And now for this function f, we can calculate the Fourier series simply by calculating the coefficients. So here we just have an integral and since half of the function is at zero, we just have an integral from minus pi to zero. And integrating a constant is not a problem at all. What we get out here is one divided by the square root of two. So the first coefficient is done. Let's go to the next one where we have a general k. However, we see that this integral can also be calculated in general. With the same reason as before, we just have to integrate from minus pi to zero. However, now because of the symmetry of the cosine on this interval, we get out zero. Alternatively, you can also take the sine function as the antiderivative and then you also get out zero. Then in the next step, let's calculate the bk coefficients. Still, we only have to integrate from minus pi to zero, but now we don't get out zero every time. Indeed, for this integral here, finding an antiderivative is not a problem at all, because we know that minus cosine does the trick. However, we should not forget the factor that comes in, which is 1 over k. And now we evaluate the thing at 0 and minus pi. And at that point we recognize that we have two different cases, namely, at one case both things are the same, and the other they have different signs. So by skipping the calculation, I can already tell you we have zero if k is even. And minus two divided by pi k in the other case. And with that we have it, we can write down the whole Fourier series for this function f. Now the first term is just this constant here, so one over the square root of two times one over the square root of two. Which means we have exactly one half in the constant of the Fourier series. And then we don't have the cosine terms, we just have the sine terms. And the first coefficient we have here is minus two divided by pi. Which means if we stop the Fourier series here, we just have a constant minus a scaled sine function. Therefore, I would say let's plot it with Python. So you see it's not so complicated. Here in black we have our step function, so our function f. And this one is the constant plus the scaled sine function. It's an approximation of our original function, but please always keep in mind it's an approximation with respect to the integral between both functions. What this means in a pointwise manner is not clear at all yet. However, here I would say let's continue the Fourier series with one more term. The next odd number is three, so we have minus two divided by pi times three and in the sine function we have the 3 as well. So quite nice, I would say, let's put this into the plot as well. And then we see we have more oscillations, so it's more similar to our step function. But please recall, the orthogonal projection tells us this is the best trigonometric polynomial with this degree. And again, best here simply means that the distance calculated in the integral sense is minimized. And now what you can do, you can play with it, you can take the number higher and higher to see what happens. So for example, this would be the picture including the next term. And then we can just do more and more. So I think that's good enough for the visualization here, but of course it's a good exercise to look at some more functions and the Fourier series for them. And after that you have a good idea what is happening and then we can continue the theory of it. Therefore, I would say let's meet in the next video and have a nice day. Bye bye.